to say that the session is, oh, there you go, yeah, the red light's gone on my screen. We're now on YouTube as well. Um, when we get to the q and I'll tell you about the q and in a moment, um, then bear in mind that this event is uh, essentially open to the whole internet, um, Russian, Russian sex bots and all. So uh, if you ask a question, then you're talking to uh, all of humanity and not just the uh, collection of uh, fascinating souls sharing the electronic room with us today. Um, Format. Uh, John, in a second, is going to give us a potted summary of uh, hundreds of pages of erudition and thought in uh, you know, 30 words or fewer, I think. Um, I will then ask him a few inane questions indicating that I probably haven't understood his book properly. He'll be polite enough to answer without putting that out. Um, and then we will proceed until such point as you know, you've asked enough good questions that I can stop asking questions and put your questions to John instead. Um, uh, I one thing I have to apologize for. I think we'd said um, we'd ask for an hour of your time for this session. I, because I'm incompetent and have managed my diary very badly, I have to draw this session to a close at 5:50. So uh, you get 10 minutes back, uh, which is time you can spend buying the book. Um, uh, and then I don't know. Yeah, I'll only take one click on Amazon. You can do something else after that. So 5:50, we'll 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 draw things to a close. Um, I think that's all the housekeeping. Um, my colleagues who are invisible to me. Um, and you lurking in the uh, electronic wings of Zoom or hanging around may well prod me and tell me I've forgotten something like what we do in the event of a fire, a fire escape or something. Um, uh, no, so that's, that's, from, that's, that's from, back, from back in the old days. Uh, we will get back to the office again one day, I'm sure. Anyway, so that's uh, enough of the preamble. Um, I will now go to John, John Yates. Um, if, sorry, actually, I'll bring, a brief introduction to who John is. Hopefully you all know, because you've really come along and talk, you, you listen, listen to him talk about his book. Um, um, uh, former, former several things and a current uh, and a current couple of things, I suppose. Well, it's a former. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, John. Um, former uh, McKinsey consultant, former government advisor on education policy. Um, now um, running in the day job. Um, uh, sorry, there's too many of you these days. Youth in, is, it, is, it, is it the Youth Endowment Foundation? No, it's not. Um, yes, Youth Endowment. Pretty close. Youth Endowment Fund. You, you, you know, two fund. Out of three. Youth Endowment Fund, a big pot of money that does good things with young people, has previously done things like setting up National Citizen Service and stuff like that. We'll, we'll hear all hear more about that uh, from the moment. And also, um, uh, author, um, hence the book Fractured, published tomorrow and available in all good bookshops and our, from our lovely friends at Amazon. Um, um, John, so this book, um, I think we, 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 you know, we, we enticed everyone into the event by you know, saying, you know, using your right, your sort of uh, PR, as it were, uh, this book about how, how societies are coming apart and what can be done to put them back together. Um, you know, and it, it, it obviously covers lots of different aspects of human behavior, organization, uh, education, uh, you know, urban development, uh, you know, philosophy, economics, politics, a lot. I mean, can you try and summarize your your key points for us in you know, I don't know six seven eight minutes? Um, uh, kind of, yeah, I know you've put you poured your life and life and soul into this book, and there's something heartbreaking about being asked to yeah asked to summarize all of, all of that erudition in, uh, in in such a small period of time. But have, give, give that a go, and then I'll ask you some questions, and then we'll go to uh, we'll, we'll keep an eye on the uh, the Q and A uh, the Q and A panel um, from our uh, our audience um, and audience be prepared if you like to put questions on the Q&A panel, do that. And uh, also, I may, if you want to, um, we can put you on camera and you can actually ask your questions to John directly, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. So anyway, um, for now, I'm going I'm to put myself on mute, shut up to your enormous relief and let John talk for a bit. John. James, thanks, thanks so much. And thanks for, uh, thanks for inviting me along to, to, to talk. And thank you to everyone for making the time uh, to, to, to engage with this. Um, so I'm very happy to do this uh, quite briefly. When I was a, a consultant, we used to have to do what was called the elevator test. Can you explain your idea in 30 seconds? So eight minutes is basically a, a short term breakdown in the elevator. Um, the, core, the core argument of the book, the book this book Fractured, um, is that the average uh, Brit and the majority of Americans are right about something, uh, which is that uh, they believe that their country it has never been so divided. And I think you can see the evidence for division um, it really close to home. You can see it in our friendship groups. So um, the um, half of us who uh, are graduates have no friends uh, who don't have a degree. 
uh, the vast majority of pensioners don't have any contact with anyone who's under the age of 35 unless it's their grandchildren. Uh, a fifth of those who voted to leave and a quarter of those who voted to remain don't know anyone who voted the other way that they would count as a, as a friend. Uh, half of us don't have any friends from a different ethnic group uh, and the greatest divide of all remains uh, remains class or, or wealth. So uh, a UK barrister would have to invite 100 people into their garden, so breaking the law by a factor of three at the moment, um, before they would invite somebody they knew who was unemployed. Uh, and so we are um, quite strikingly siloed uh, in our in our in our networks and our connections. Um, now the question is, uh, the book is basically a, a sort of mystery. It's basically saying, why why is this happening? Uh, does it matter? And if it does matter, what do we do about it? Well, why is it happening? Uh, again, I think the average person often has a better sense of what's going on uh, than those of us who are writing uh, writing columns and writing books. And, and the the average person, if you ask them about this, will tend to say, and they do say to me, "Come on, John." It's always been a bit like this. Um, uh, birds of a feather flock together, tends to be the phrase that, that comes out. And I think the, 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 the people who say that to me are basically right. Um, and uh, scientists have, have shown this. 37,000 studies uh, published from uh, Kuala Lumpur to Kingston show that we have a small constant bias towards people who remind us of ourselves. Scientists call this uh, homophily. Uh, I prefer the term people like me syndrome. And this, this constant bias is absolutely at the core of, uh, of, of our divisions. It, it affects who we choose to work with. It affects who we write academic papers with. It, it affects who we make friends with. It, it affects uh, who we move uh, next door to. Um, but it is a, a partial answer to explaining our divisions. Um, because if, if the question is, why are we more divided now? If I say that the cause is a constant bias, it doesn't really make sense because it's constant. It's a bit like saying, why is it so sunny today? And I said, well, the sun. I mean, the sun is a good part of the explanation, but it doesn't really explain why it wasn't sunny every single day forever. So there's something else that's, that's going on. And, and to understand that, I, uh, I lay out in the book, I think we need to turn our attention uh, to uh, Lake Iyasi, which is a, a lake in uh, northern Tanzania. Uh, and there's a tribe that lives around Lake Iyasi called the Hadza, uh, who are quite unusual, They're about 400 members. And they've been there for 60,000 years um, and they are still hunter gathering. Now, what's what's fascinating about the Hadza when sociologists followed them um, is um, is, is that they once a month when when the, when the sky is without a moon at night they they gather together wherever they bedded down and they take part in something called the apem. Now uh, the apem is basically a dance and uh, the the men hide and they come out one by one and they put on ostrich feathers black ostrich feathers and they they hold a, a rattle and they put um, uh, bells around one ankle and they perform a ritualized dance and the women join in and the children join in and then each man dances two or three times. Now, what's odd about the APEM is it doesn't have any purpose. There, there's no obvious point to it. it. It doesn't create something in the economy. It's not part of some organised religion. There's no, some, no great explanation for what it's doing. But what the sociologists did is they, they followed um, the, the members of the Hadza and they saw who do they gossip with? Who do they hang out with? Who do they spend time with? Who do they share tools with? Uh, and they found there were basically two types of people they tended to trust. One was people they were really closely related to. So little family units make up the Hadza tribe. But the second was anyone they danced the Apem with. And what the, the sociologists actually found is that the Hadza are more likely to trust someone they've recently danced the Apem with than someone that they're actually blood related to. And so in our language, what the Apem is doing for the Hadza is it's making their diversity work. Now, when you start looking for these sort of institutions that bring people together, not by choice, but by happenstance or by compulsion what you find is people that people aren't choosing so people like me syndrome can't get in uh, and 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 they form you form these little bonds now once you look through history you can see these institutions all over the place so if you look at the history of, of, of hum humanity we most of us stopped being hunter gatherers and we became farmers and we settled into villages the the, the sort of a pem dance has died out but we found new ways to come together. So uh, from feast days to rites of passage to religious ceremonies, and these were a big deal. So a, a 14th century uh, person living in England would spend one in four days in a feast day. You know, that's, that's a significant amount of time. If you look at 
post the industrial revolution, when we start to settle into cities, a lot of what I've just described vanishes, but you see a load of new institutions spring up. So clubs and societies being a, a, a massive one, nearly all the main clubs and societies we would think of from the scouts to the guides, to the Freemasons, to the mother's union date from about 17, 1750 to sort of 1910. And they all spring up about then. But you also see a new type of, of institution, which is more mandatory. So uh, I think about the school, uh, not mandatory in the UK till 1880. Or think about the workplace. People broadly had to go to work. And in both the school and the workplace, they didn't really choose. They just went locally. Now, these institutions that I've just described, there's, there's no name for them. Uh, and in the book, I call them the common life. Now, the, 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 the history of humanity in our divisions is basically an ongoing fight between people like me syndrome on the one hand, pulling us towards people like us, and the common life, knitting us to people broadly at random and forming a bond uh, across those lines of, of difference. So the reason that we're dividing is because we've began to see a decline in the common life that knitted our grandparents and our great grandparents uh, together. Uh, every single generation since 1950 in this country, less likely to join a club and society than the previous one. Of course, people still go to school uh, and most of us still go to work, but we choose. Uh, we increasingly choose where we send our children and we obviously choose uh, most of us where we choose to work. And so people like me syndrome comes uh, comes back in. Uh, and this this matters. Uh, and I won't go into this now, but you, you I lay out in the book the impact this has on our democracy, making it more fragile, the impact it has on social mobility, on our economy, on our security from terrorism, uh, and also our health and our levels of anxiety. Um, so, so the question, that, the final question is, OK, what's actually driving it and what do we do about it? And, and the bad news for a, for a Westerner uh, who likes generally Western society society, um, is that two of the, the villains of the piece are things that I really like. So, you know, what is it that undid the mandatory uh, common life? What is it that's affected the schools and the workplace? Well, it's choice. It's the fact that now I choose. And I like choosing. And I think it actually helps improve our schools. And it's actually very good in many ways. But uh, choice means that you don't have a place where you're by happenstance mixing with people. Then what about the more voluntary? People weren't forced, aren't forced to dance the APEM. No one was forced to do the feast days, though there was obviously a bit of the pressure. Um, no one was forced to join a club and society. Why did these things die out? Um, well, they died out in each case because of very fast change. Um, and we've seen huge amounts of, of, of change over the last uh, 50, 60, 70 years. Uh, and so when we see uh, change to the way our economy works, to competition for our time, to our values and to the movement of people, uh, generally businesses adapt. Uh, if, and if they don't, they die off and someone sets up a new business. That's just not true for voluntary uh, coming together. People, venture capitalists aren't waiting around to set up new voluntary associations. Uh, they don't fail fast. People cling on to them and let them die away slowly. And so we find ourselves in what I call an interregnum, a, a period between when we had a common life that was pretty significant to one where we have one that's very weak. Uh, and the result is our division. So, so, so what do we do about it? Well, as I come into land, there's three things that I think, three options that we, we've got to choose from. Uh, the first one is to do absolutely nothing about it, to say, well, you know, these things come, these things go. Uh, a new common life will spring up. Uh, it happened before something will turn up. Um, now, I think that's a perfectly valid option. It is the option that pretty much every Western society in the world is taking at the moment. Um, we just should be prepared to wait quite a while. It took a thousand years for the agrarian common life to spring up by chance. It took about a hundred years for the industrial common life. So we should uh, be prepared to wait and stop whining about our divisions. The, the second option is to try and slow down that disruption in the pace of the pace of change. Um, this is broadly the route that the Nordic countries have taken. I, I don't think they've done it on purpose. Um, but they have had a much slower rate of change. And that's partly because they've protected jobs and people's security uh, as, uh, as the economy has changed. It's partly their values haven't changed so much during this period. They have had less immigration and they do watch less telly. <laughs> they've had less competition for people's time. Um, now, the result is that their clubs and associations have stayed um, at, a decent, at a decent level. And when you rank the rich countries for whether people trust each other, whether they take responsibility for each other, whether they reach out and look out for each other, these countries come first, second, third, and fifth. 
I just don't think slow the rate of change is a credible option, though, because of the amount of change that we've likely got coming down the line over the next 50 to 100 years. So the final option. Well, the final option takes us to the country that came fourth in that list of five, um, which has taken a totally different uh, approach to this problem. Uh, it's, it's Singapore. And now Singapore's approach has been very pro-change, very high rate of immigration. 40% of people uh, were born overseas and very open to the economy changing. Uh, but they have decided to play against the issue of choice. And so they create space in their societies where people have to come together. So people have to do national service. But the schools are organised so that you will get a mix of people together. Uh, and they've even got involved in the allocation of housing, public housing. 80% of housing in Singapore is owned actually by the government, remarkably. Now, I don't think we can sort of copy and paste the Singaporean model, but but I do think we might do a Western version of it. Uh, now, what might that look like? I mean, the first reaction is that it sounds like some sort of fascism. Well, let me just give you a sense. Uh, I think it might look like a, 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 a community service programme for teenagers as part of the national curriculum. I think it might look like uh, when we put proper money into childcare, which we should, uh, a requirement for parents to turn up to the first five or six sessions at the nursery to learn how their children's brain works, but in it to mix with parents from other parts of town. Uh, and finally, I think it might look like a national retirement programme to actually make sure that as people move from the world of work into the world of post-work, they have some networks and connections to get them involved in their, their community. Now, now, the response to this, which is an obvious one, I think is, well, this is just completely in conceivable and so to close all, all I would say to that is is firstly well maybe it is um but but I don't know what the alternative realistic alternative is uh, uh so far we seem to be bringing uh, warm words to a to a gunfight uh with little celebrations for the queen's birthday uh, and some ongoing constant talk about british values uh the, the final thing i would say is uh, that in my view all significant political movements and changes start off as inconceivable from the creation of the NHS to private mass privatization to the joining of the EU creation of the EU to the departure from the EU uh, most big ideas start off as inconceivable and then come become imaginable and then become likely and then become unavoidable uh, and in writing this uh, book which I hope you'll all enjoy uh, I want to start that journey towards the idea of a mandatory common life being imaginable uh, James I hope that helps as a sort of elevator pitch that's uh, I, uh, very, very well done. Th thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, and I should also point, point out, n nobody has yet, yet, yet pointed out in the uh, in, in the comments, you may have been thinking of it, we, we, we are, uh, we, we quite deliberately thought we would demonstrate John's point about uh, yeah, homophily by making sure that the two people visible on your screen today are both uh, middle-aged white nerds in blue check shirts. So it, it, this, is, this, is, this is performance art as well as, you know, uh, as well as a, a, a debate. Um, uh, I want to ask a, yeah, a first question, John, um, about yeah, you know, the, one of the, the, the problem, uh, the, the problems you identified, I suppose, you know, the, the things that drive this clustering um, of you know people by by type, um, and it's about choice, um, because you know, lots of the things that you describe in the book are you know, people choosing to live with and among people who are like them to form social networks with people who are of similar type background origin disposition and outlook um and essentially i suppose you know, it comes to your, your last point i mean given that that is an exercise of choice yeah, um absent a, a, a sort of state intervention I think the likes of which you're ruling out um, isn't th the issue that you're describing just inevitable that in a free society people will exercise free choice to form those clusters um, uh, and continue the process that you know that, that you've described so well in the book I mean, uh, or am I, am I being too pessimistic can, can can people be persuaded to exercise choice to move back in the opposite direction, do you think? Yes, yeah, so, so I wouldn't rule out state intervention. Uh, you know, I, I, I think we do need uh, 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 the state to intervene. Um, or to put it a different way, I think we've got two, op as I said, you know, three options, slow down the rate of change, mandate the requirement to spend time together, 
or wait for some new common life to turn up. So, so I do, I, I am broadly slightly pessimistic if, if we don't do something with state intervention. And, and I base that uh, partly on the evidence, as I lay it out in the book, uh, that people like me syndrome is significant. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with it in so many ways. I mean, there's nothing at all wrong. You know, I like the West Wing, uh, and I obviously like wearing blue check shirts. Uh, and I, uh, you know, and I, and I also like watching, uh, I, I'm gonna enjoy watching Euro 2020 or 2021, or whatever we're calling it now. Um, and I don't think other people should have to suffer me talking about the West Wing and Euro 2021 and my love of blue check shirts, unless they're into those things. Uh, so there's nothing wrong at all with a degree of this bias. It, it, in some ways, it's a perfectly good way for us to live our lives doing things we're interested in. Um, however, um, the, the, the impact of the, these silos is significant. Um, uh, on weakening our democracy, on messing up social mobility. And so um, I think we have to do something while not saying it's a terrible thing and awful, isn't it? Awful that we like people like us. Um, now, I think you could, I, I, I also base my argument that the state needs to intervene, though, on my personal experience. You know, I've, I spent 10 years and about 250 million pounds um, building a program to bring people from different backgrounds together voluntarily. This is the National Citizen Service. And it's the fastest growing youth program in Europe since the Scouts was founded in 1910. I mean, that is a relatively significant success, um, but we could only reach one in six young people. Um, and so I, I just don't believe you can do this voluntarily unless you strike it really lucky and someone comes up with something that just so fits the moment, is so zeitgeisty that people just long to do it. And I think that's what happened with clubs and societies in the sort of 18, in the 19th century. And I think that's what happened with feast days and organised religion for agrarian societies. And I think that's what happened with rituals like the Apem for the Hadza. But it, it, it takes time for those things to pop up. Uh, and I don't, I, I don't think we should wait. I do lay out in the book, you know, I'm not trying to be completely status i do lay out the book 32 things an individual could do so there are things we can do and those of us who are interested in this can do stuff to nudge things um but no i i, I do think if we're if we're serious about this we should look uh, to actually design together things that would be mandatory i just don't think that's that horrific i mean the west accepts the idea we, most of us agree that we should be able to spend our own money and we think it should be left to our own devices how we spend our money but we also think if we don't pool some money through taxation uh, our ability to get the things we want and the society we want falls apart quite badly um and, and we accept a world that the government forces money out of my hands to pay for things i may morally be massively opposed to whether it's the forced repatriation of people depending on my view on immigration or abortion depending on my view we totally accept this uh, and so i i think this is at the moment inconceivable but i'm arguing that it shouldn't be inconceivable well, 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 well which actually brought us slightly more quickly than I, I intended on, on to Singapore, I suppose. Um, and um, because you know, some of you who come to us events will know, or you may have heard me you know, semi-jokingly say that um, those of us who run think tanks, if we're ever in doubt, of, doubt about what to say or recommend, I, you, we just say, oh God, look at Singapore and do what they do there. So um, it's nice to actually have a, a slightly more novel, novel take on, on the role of Singapore as, a, as an exemplar. Um, but can, can you just expand a little bit on your, I mean, the three, the, the three interventions that you uh, you've drawn from Singapore to national national service for young people or community service for young people. I think that's relatively service monetary. Parent, yeah, the, the parenting classes point, and particularly the one I'm very interested in is the the national retirement service. Um, I, you run us through those briefly. Obviously, particularly if you just explain how, what degree of not bloody, what degree of compulsion you, you think we should be looking for on those things. Um, as to how, yeah. how firmly can can and should the state push people into participating in schemes like that. Yeah, so um, the, 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 the reason I wanted to give specific examples is that when you use specific examples, you then have a much more meaningful conversation about whether this is oppressive or not. And I think I think the examples I give, it's just harder to go, God, that sounds like the most oppressive thing ever, getting our children who've got to spend 100 months in school pretty much by law to spend one month doing community service as part of that. Um, now, on the, on, the, on the compulsion, I would like to make, I, so let me explain, it, 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 it puts this as a contradiction. I would like these things to be compulsory. Uh, because I think we need them to be. I'd love us not to need them to be, but I think we need them to be. Um, uh, but but I don't like the idea of saying people going to jail for not doing them. So there's a slight contradiction there. So the way I would tend to approach that is I'd want to tie it to a benefit um, that you just don't get uh, unless you do the thing. So the the, the childcare uh, subsidy 
that I would recommend would only come if you turn up to these five or six sessions. Now, I, I, you'd also want to make it uh, tie it into a strong sense of, uh, of, of, of clever push and marketing that it made it say, look, this is just a good thing to do. Um, you know, it, it, so you, you've got to somehow, what is the group that's most divided from the rest of us? It's actually the rich. You know, it's the richest five or six percent of the population. So, so the danger of just tying it to a benefit without a stronger sense of a bit of a tut to those who don't take part um, is you just won't reach uh, reach that other group. Now, I, I use the specific examples to just show I don't think this is some sort of fascism. But I do say in the book, it's less about the specific examples, really. It's more about how would you pick these things? Because a country should decide for itself what feels, feels best. And my, my principles that I lay out is that we shouldn't, we shouldn't mandate anything that the majority of the population is not in support of. Secondly, we shouldn't mandate anything that the majority of the people who would be required to take part is not in support of. Thirdly, we shouldn't mandate anything that the majority of people who have taken part don't remain in support of. Now, I, I think what you'll come up with is mo- things around moments of transition. Like it tends to be when our life is in transition, we, we go through puberty, we find our first job, we settle down in a new area, we have a child, we retire. Those tend to be the moments where we're actually ha- are quite in the market for something that builds a network and brings us together. I mean, that's why NCT, National Childbirth Trust, does so well. It's not primarily because people want to know about childbirth. It is primarily because people want to make friends and networks. Um, yes, um, uh, all network. All one could say, uh, speaking of someone who's been through NCT, they want to make you know, networks of people like them. You approve you approve your point, but uh, which may, may make the argument for, uh, for for broadening the the basis. Um, I suppose the, the question sort of falls on from, from that a little is trying to get you know essentially how, how do you get how do you get people to choose. How do you get people to choose something that may constrain their choice? I mean, how, yeah, how can you conceive of getting political buy-in to the sort of interventions that you're talking about for an electorate that is increasingly used to choosing things and having a sort of individual individual choice be respected? And I, I know this is why one of the reasons I was keen to do uh, to do, do this talk and talk about your books. I think you're absolutely tapping into something really, really important. Um, and um, I'm going to use this as an excuse to segue slightly into your, you, you, you mentioned TV earlier on, you talked about the amount of time that we spent, t- you, we, we spent watching TV. Um, I think in, in the book you, you, you cite, it's Robert Putnam's uh, calculation showing that essentially the, the rise of TV matches the, the fall in community, uh, community participation in, in, in the US. Um, but I wonder whether, you know, whether or not actually relative to the internet, the TV, your, your TV, will one day come to be seen as a relatively unifying force so we're providing us with common experience because you know I, i'm you know I, i'm uh, here I'm, I'm 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 45 so i, I grew up I came of age in the 1980s and yeah you know, yeah i didn't go to youth clubs um but i i participated in a society whose common common experiences common moments were often provided by tv you know hugh shot jr um you know den andrew getting divorced on eastenders dennis taylor playing snooker one night in 1986 watched by 28 and a half million people in the uk I mean, yeah I, I like to bore my younger colleagues with the smf for these these things just to illustrate to them how boring britain used to be before they were born um but equally you know that gave us something you know that gave us something in common um, and now we live in an era when nobody has to watch the same TV as anybody else. Nobody has to experience, experience the same you know, intellectual uh, entertainment world as anybody else because they have a device in their hand that gives them exactly what they want. Um, uh, uh, and I'm just curious to know your, 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 your thoughts on whether or not we, we've essentially created through the internet a, an individual choice monster that we can never uh yeah we can never know even the state even the power of the state the coercive power of the state forcing us into six out you know, six hours of, uh, of parenting classes or three months of community activity whether we can never actually quite you know, uh, you know, put that put that you know, put that, that 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 creature back in its bottle 
Yeah, so so um, oh, so so many interesting things. Uh, I mean, uh, just very briefly on, on NCT, you're right uh, uh, that, that when people have a baby, just before they have a baby, they really want people like them. But when after people have a baby, we just really seen polling on this. Um, people feel differently. Um, they 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 see anyone else who's got a baby as someone like them, uh, and, and they see them as unique, equally uniquely hapless. Uh, and so I do think the timing of that intervention makes a colossal difference. Um, the 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 TV the, so. Um, I, I am. I am. One of the themes of the book, one of the main points of the book, is that we're overstating the impact of social media and understating the impact of TV. Um, and, and part of the reason I make that argument is not because I think social media is, you know, an excellent way to connect people. It's basically people like me syndrome on 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 steroids um, because it's just so incredibly easy to decide who to follow. Moving house to live next to someone like you is quite a faff. Deciding not to hang out with these people and hang out with these people is at least slightly socially awkward. Deciding to follow someone else is like <laughs> low effort. So I, I do think social media is problematic, um, but um, I think the, 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 if you look, look at the Nordic countries, look at uh, Singapore, they, they have social media. I, I think the reason that it's had such a negative impact um, is because we were already so divided. And so messages telling us that this group of people were untrustworthy weren't being checked by the fact that, hang on, my friend is one is, would be described as those people. This doesn't this doesn't add up. And, and I do pick on TV because there's an excellent um, study which was done in Canada of a place called Notel, uh, which is a, a real town, but the not its right name. And it was called Notel because the TV signal couldn't reach the town. Uh, and they tracked the t they compared the town with the towns nearby that had got the TV signal. And you see the hollowing out of community activity. And then they 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 followed it as the TV signal reached Notel. And within two years, community activity has fallen dramatically. And so I do think you can have, I mean, the, the technical language is parasocial. You can have moments, sometimes referred to as the will and grace effect. You can have moments where through TV you have, have a shared experience or you 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 do feel like you're meeting someone who is different. That's not worth nothing. I, I just I just don't want to overstate the value of it compared to actually having a friend uh, who is who is different. And I also think those moments that you mentioned, they're not they're not every week. You know, they, they tend to be in my memory of them. They tend to be sort of once every two years, every every twice a year, maybe you'd have a moment that was really water coolery. Um, I, 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 I managed to identify three moments, three moments <laughs> in a decade. So, yes, that's um, I want to be generous. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, um, uh, and, you, know, you, you touched on slightly, you know, you're slightly, the, the next thing I want to come on to before I start you know, bringing in some questions from our um, uh, from our audience, um, you, you mentioned education earlier on, um, and that seems to be where, where this, I mean, yeah, this really does sort of, yeah, this, but this does bite, I suppose, in terms of you know, actual real world and sort of the, the policy world that we, we, we probably live in at the, at the SMF. Because there is a whole well, I have a you know very much persuaded by the the argument that education is one of the big, if not the big, uh, political dividing lines that is becoming more and more relevant to to voting patterns and you know cultural cultural divides, if you like. Um, uh, and I suppose well, yeah, there's a, there's, there are a lot of questions that that, that flow from all that. Um, one of which would be about the um, well. Well, just school choice generally, because you know, obviously, short of you know forcing people to not move house or, or, or giving people essentially no say over where their children go to school, um, isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't a certain amount of clustering going to be inevitable that people will either buy houses or you know however however they do it? Essentially, you know, the most well, as we know, you know, you're a former education advisor. You know, one of the most powerful forces in the known universe is is middle class parents. Um, one way or another, they, they they will find a way to get to get their children to you know, wherever they want them to go, and that that will lead to the clustering you're talking about, which mm. flows through you know, you know, through through the generations. Um, so, uh, you know, do we have too much choice in education, including the yeah you know, the choice to uh, yeah, educate our children privately? Do you think? Um, 
Yeah, so, so uh, you know, as I say, as you say, I used to advise the education secretary. So uh, this is, is significant uh, for me. I, so I, I think the um, look, the first thing I say is I, the book isn't written with a sense of there's some baddies out there and they're middle class parents. So I'm coming to criticise them. Uh, the book is written assuming everyone's just like me and thinking, OK, considering people are broadly, let's say, a bit like me, I've just moved house to get my child into a good secondary school. So I'm not I'm, I, and I'm not I, trying I, to... I, 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 I'm a middle class parent who moved house to get my child into a good primary school school so I, yeah. I know, yeah, there's no so yeah, i'm not no. i'm definitely not trying to sort of condemn parents for you know caring for their their, their children i'm not trying to be a hypocrite myself I, I think my behavior is very rational um and i think it's moral and it's caring for my child um i, I think it's saying that okay so if, if that's always going to happen where else can we do things i mean so the, the two the two very brief thoughts came to my mind one is Scandinavia is again fascinating. The Nordics are fascinating. So I had a friend around literally this weekend uh, from Denmark, and I, I wanted to check the evidence I'd got. And I said to him, "Tell me about schools uh, and how you chose your school." And he's like, "Well, we just you don't. You just go to the. It's all the same. You just go to the." And I said, "And what's the and, and what's the school like? Oh, it's total mix of people from different backgrounds." <laughs> so you, the Nordics are have got into a different equilibrium, and I do think part of what's going on with school choice, part of it is about how good is the school, but part of it is also I'm a bit afraid of the other. Hang on a moment, you know I, that that school looks full of people who don't look quite like my child and aren't quite like. If we're honest, aren't quite like my child. And the more segregated our society is, the more more the more fearful we are. Which is why I'm keen that we find other ways to connect people. The, the second thing is, um, I do think that private schools raises an interesting question, as do grammar schools. But but there are only you know 163 grammar schools and only seven percent of kids go to private schools. The thing I would focus on is the government changed the law about a decade ago to say that every single state school could res- could could reserve a certain number of places for kids on free school meals. How many schools have actually taken that power up? You know, someone's listening who's a school governor. Why haven't you done it? <laughs> Why not raise it at the next meeting? Like, what is the argument against doing it? Uh, if, if people don't apply, they won't come. But why not reserve, you know, 17% of the kids on free school meals in the country? Why not reserve 17% of your places for children on free school meals? I can't imagine what the what the rationale for not doing that is that we're all prepared to say out loud. So that would be that would be one push I would I would make. I, I I don't know if he's actually if he's here electronically, but if on the on the first point on the uh, yeah on the, the Nordic model uh, of education choice, um, if my colleague Avik Bacharya from the SMF was here, he's just not long ago completed a PhD in comparative choice choice choices in English and Scottish uh, systems, and I think he'd probably point out that actually what, what you described for Denmark is also very true of uh, more true of Scotland. So we we may have a, a better example in in the UK. Um, uh, uh, now, at this point, I'm going to try, you try and hand over to you know, to the audience, as it were, um, because we've got, we've got 10 minutes left. So um, what I might try and do first is I'm going to try and get um, if, uh, if this Liz Gad is on the on the line, as it were, that's where I do my bad, my bad provincial DJ impression. Um, if someone if Liz, do you, do you actually want to come on camera? There you go. Liz is appearing and about to be unmuted. There, Liz, Liz Gad. Liz, what, what, what did you want to ask John? Hello, Jan. Lovely to see you. It's been a while since the challenge days. I was really interested in the three options you outlined for what we might do to tackle some of these issues, do nothing and and so on, and was wondering what your perspective is on what each of those issues, if we took each of those three paths, would mean for us as we go through the next decade in the transition to net zero. Yes, I, I think there's a link here. I mean, I mean, uh, two, two, two small points. Um, one is I think this problem is not that different from the climate change problem in, in, in one way, which is that I think there are things individuals can do. Um, and we kid ourselves as we as individuals assume we can do nothing about it. But we also kid ourselves if we think this is a problem we can solve by individuals. Um, it does require government action. And, and, and I see exactly in the same way climate change does. But the, but the starting point was to engage individuals in it and to get people thinking about it. And then the idea of the government um, requiring children to do some community service uh, it doesn't start to feel so uh, uh, terrifying. Um, the, 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 the second point is, Things like um, big, you know, big demograph- democratic decisions um, that are necessary but don't bring immediate benefit, may bring short-term costs, are really hard in a divided society. Um, there, there's a there's a 
uh, part of the book, I talk about the impact on democracy. And what you find is in a more segregated society, and you see this in parts of the US, that the more division there is in a local area, the less people are prepared to support investment in public goods. So bridges, schools, hospitals, but in, that could include investment in climate change uh, efforts. And the reason is when you, when you sort of get, you, the correlation is really clear, but when you ask people about it, they'll say, I just think, you know, all the benefits will go to, you know, them uh, and I'm just not sure they work for it and so this this problem it's often described as a problem of diversity I think that's an oversimplification if everyone's equally homogenous the problem does tend to go away but that's not an option for us and so um, I, it's a problem for me about a lack of connection um, you know who, who who is what is it that's making us allow us to think those people are other it's the fact we never really meet them um, uh, at the risk of advertising briefly some, some future, well, a future program of work at the SMF, I think your your point there, John, about um, trying to sort of visualise the benefits of, of policy intervention, particularly in the net zero context for people like me, um, I think you're absolutely right, is going to be very, very important because I think we are, um, the net zero agenda is in real danger of coming to be seen by essentially the people who voted to take us out of the European Union um, as being something that is being done by and for the other group of people who wanted to keep us in the European Union. I mean, that's a, that's a very, very broad generalization on my behalf. Um, and I think the real challenge for those, those of us interested in uh, climate policy, broadly speaking, favoring net zero is going to be trying to find ways of demonstrating that, uh, you know, that, that net zero decarbonization are beneficial to people like me and make that you know, make that point to you, you to that group I think that's one of the you know the, the coming questions of politics and so I think um, I think and hope that you will be in demand for um, advising and uh, counseling on, on on that point in the net zero context um, I'm going I was going to say, Singapore Games, like, really, I, I mentioned the Nordics, like, you know, uh, how they handle these things, but the Singapore Games really interesting. Like, you know, they, they have been very, very effective in making very sensible choices as an executive um, leadership for that, for that country. And look, we tend to say, well, you know, the leader was very, very clever and they opened up to, uh, you know, the, the, the multinational companies and they did, they did all this right. And I think we really missed the fact that they didn't have an opening for division. So it wasn't possible for, uh, so we easy for there to be a huge opposition to what was going on and someone will say well, yeah but it wasn't properly dem democratic so that's how they did it well Sri Lanka wasn't properly democratic not really <laughs> and the, but it blew itself apart by having tribal politics and what Lee Kuan Yew did I mean he, he was when he was asked you know what's his main concern when he when he found himself running in Singapore a country that didn't have enough people to defend itself didn't have enough space to grow enough land to grow, to grow food to feed itself had just been thrown out of the Malay Federation his number one concern wasn't those things it was that they're going to racially divide the country and therefore they will fall apart and solve no problems. And so things like, you know, these serious issues requires a sense of us. Now, in, next, I'm going to go to, um, there's an ha electronic hand up from Scott C. I think that might actually be my colleague, my, my SMF colleague, Scott Corp. But anyway, Scott C, I don't know if, um, I'm going to press, oh yeah, it is, in fact it is. I'm, 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 yeah, I'm, yeah, do you want to unmute yourself and ask a question, Scott? And then after that, I'm going to, I'm going to summarise for you, um, Joy, a question, a sort of thematic question comes from a couple of our participants, um, Austin Kilroy and Alicia Weston, who both ask questions about social media platforms and their role in all this and how they might be made better. But anyway, that's, a, that's an advanced warning for now. Scott, Scott, um, Scott Corf. So it's a, it's a cunning ruse. It's not, ah! it's, a, it's a big bass chariot uh, logged in as Scott Corf accident. But this is... <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. Uh, not Scott Corf, Avik Bajaria, Chief Economist of the SMF, pretending to be Scott Corf, Research Director of the SMF. Oh. The, the, the question I had is, um, I wonder how much difference it makes. I wonder if there's, uh, we're misled by thinking about this as a categorical thing as opposed to a scalar thing. So if you think about common life as something you either have or you don't, then you get into concerns about can we fix it or the Nordics are not going to be able to hold back the tide. Whereas if we think about can we just nudge a bit further one way or another? Can we push a little bit in the right direction? Then, then maybe, maybe that means you're being a bit overly modest about national citizen service, which seems like something that is pushing in the right direction. And maybe, you know, we can have some of the Nordic policies and some of the Singapore policies. And are we just, if we just think about, can we turn the clock back or get back to this particular end point? Um, then maybe we, the, the task looks more forbidding than it, than it actually is or we can make better progress than, yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, look, I mean, two thoughts. One is I, I, I definitely 
wouldn't want to summarize the position as let's turn the clocks back. Um, I mean, the trouble, my, my diagnosis is the thing is cyclical, that um, we have periods where we have a common life, change happens, we lose it, we get it back again. So there are definite points in history I have no desire to go back to. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, 1950, if that's the halos on age, I mean, I, I don't need to go on about how racially unjust that period was and how, etc. cetera. So, so I'm, I'm definitely not trying to say let's turn the clock back. I'm trying to say there's a cycle and we should get onto the next cycle as fast as we possibly can. Now, um, look, is it, is it binary? Well, no, it's not. It's obviously not literally binary because um, actually the common life is, it, it, I, I'm not saying it's this amount of time and that's the common life. And if it's not that time, it's not the common life. So in a literal sense, it is a continuum. I think my critique is we thought about it as a continuum actually too much and, we, and it's allowed us to sort of play around at sort of pretending we're doing something uh you know as long as we put a as long as the government at the spending review has a little bit of money left over that it puts into social action projects uh tick <laughs> that's, that's our community work done um and i actually think we haven't taken the issue of social division at all seriously as a piece of public policy uh we we, we just don't see it as a thing we should even be talking about really as public policy it's something that nice charitable people worry about and ministers give speeches on once in a while uh a bit like isn't it nice that the birds sing uh not not <laughs> not a serious thing to be talking about and i think that's a terrible uh, it's not the singaporean approach i i think that's a terrible blunder Thank you. Now we've got we've got about well, five minutes left, and so what I'll do is I, I'll with, if if Austin Kilroy and Alicia Weston will, will forgive me, I'm going to try and summarise a, a point that the they've both made in the in, in the Q and A panel. Um, I mean, Austin, Austin's asking you know, sort of, you know sort of a little similar to some of the points I was reading about about the internet and its wicked ways earlier on. But you know, Austin says, are common life institutions possible in the online world, and can existing mm -hmm. online platforms be updated to incorporate them? So how essentially how could our social media platforms um, become pro? pro-social, pro-common pro life. Um, and um, Alicia though, you make, makes a similar point about the um, issue citing you know, John, um, uh, Jonathan Haidt's uh, work on the like button um, as being, you know, as impeding our ability to um, uh, have com conversations with people are, are, are different to ourselves. Um, I mean, do we just, you know, do we, do we just blow you? Know, do we blow you know, blow it? Well, reform Facebook and get rid and get rid of Twitter, and uh, that's the answer. I mean, I'm, I'm you know, as a, speaking as a Twitter user, I'm very I'm I'm very much in favour of getting rid of it. But um, <laughs> I mean, my so so my 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 view is that there will be some new common life. That you know, that the, the, there's been a new one evolved when we uh, when we became villagers, a new one evolved uh, when we became city dwellers. So I think a new something new will turn up. I I think I have no idea what it is, and I can't spot it. And I think every time someone says, "Oh, but the internet." Internet is gonna. We're gonna find a. I find that they haven't really got an idea for how to do it. Um, there, there are definitely things we can do to take the edge off things, uh, and um, you know, trying to convince people to uh, have a bit more randomization who they follow, uh, changing the algorithms. Uh, you know, con not ideally big companies not um, uh, um, uh, showing us things that get lots of negative responses on social media, but more biasing towards things that've got positive responses. You know, there are things we can do, but I don't think they create a common life. And so, you know, core. What is the very briefly the research says it's got to bring together people who you you didn't choose to have either an experience that's relatively intense or that involves routine you know that's what the evidence tells us connects us i think that's really hard to do online um i don't think it's impossible i just don't think anyone's worked out how to do it yet i'm actually going to slip, slip in one last question which is coming um from uh chris dobson uh about decision making democratic decision making and he, he, chris is asking um but essentially well, he, he says this conversation puts him in mind of citizens juries and people's assemblies essentially what do you what, what do you think about citizens juries yeah yeah people's assemblies because i think you point out in the book that there are there are only really two sort of yeah on juries you, juries are one of the two sort of mandatory you know, mandatory things we have to do we have to go to school for a point and eventually when the letter comes through you know if the letter comes through we have to do jury service there's about the only two things then you know we are, we are required to uh mix with uh work with live with people of all types um I mean, is there a role for I mean, is there a role for mandatory mandatory citizen jury citizen juries citizen be a people's assembly so so two I, I like citizen juries I, I I think there's you know reasonably good evidence that they have been pretty helpful for example in in, in Ireland I, I I'm not convinced that they are the solution to this problem I I feel like that, that because of the the, the the relatively small number of people that 
broadly you'd look to get involved um, and so it can sometimes be a bit performative as a way to connect people together. We, we, there's 50 million people in the country, but we've connected 500 of them. Um, and so I slightly worry about that. Having said that, you could you could say, well, let's be like Greece and uh, ancient Greece and everyone gets involved. But my slight concern is that, that people who love politics and ideas when charged with how do we bring people together go, let's get everyone discussing politics. And I think that most people don't want to talk about that they'd much prefer to play football or with with people they don't know or join a club or do something interesting rather than talk about where the council should do about uh, road signs um and so that'd be my only caution um but i think it would have to involve many more people to have a a, a significant impact yes yeah, so you guys you, you i'm sure you're aware our, our current prime minister is a uh, as a classicist is forever banging on about being being since you know, cincinnati has pulled from the plow and forced you know, forced to serve as, as an act of civic leadership as a uh, humble citizen you know, citizen given you know given power but um we'll, we'll gloss over that um i um uh, i'm now i mean one minute over the time when i said we were actually going to bring this to a slightly premature halt and again my apologies for not going the full uh, the full distance i yeah i we could happily have gone under other circumstances would happily have gone on for a whole other hour because it's a fascinating book and it's a brilliant topic um i am just going to say uh at this point essentially say thank you to, to to john for coming here to talk about the book um uh thank you to everyone in the in the audience um for uh for being with us for for the questions um yeah you've now got nine minutes of your life back that you weren't expecting you really should use that to go to a um well go to a bookseller of some sort um and purchase a copy of fractured which comes out tomorrow that's right. Order it today. We'll have it tomorrow. Order it today. Have it tomorrow. And then go and get then then go and go and accost a stranger on the street who you've never met, who doesn't look, <laughs> look anything like you, uh, and tell tell them one of one of one of the things you learn in the book, um, and, and illustrate its wisdom. So um, that's really all from um, from us. But yeah, I said thank you. Yeah, thank you, John. Thank you all of you. Um, uh, hopefully, um, we will see you all um, at further uh, SMF events in future, and with a bit of luck after. Uh, after the summer, we might even be back in our, uh, our humble office on Tofton Street, and we can, um, uh, yeah, we, we may welcome you there uh, again one day. But for now, I'm just going to say uh, thank you very much um, for joining us, and good.